SACPA acknowledges that this event takes place on the lands of the Blackfoot people and Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3, and we pay respect to their past, present, and future cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship to the land. SACPA commits to assist reconciliation efforts by raising awareness of the ways past and present injustices can be reconciled. Okay, our speaker is Dave Carpenter. He'll be speaking on the UCP's Alberta Pension Plan, Just Pixie Dust and Unicorns, question mark. Please join with me in welcoming David Carpenter. Thank you very much. <laughs> so thank you very much, Beth. Uh, such a delight to be here. Uh, mayors and stallions and all of the rest of you, uh, <laughs> glad to see you again. I'm, uh, for the, uh, I left this up here because someone was going to say, I'm sure, he doesn't know a unicorn if he met him in his soup. So this is just, a, I think it was at my grandmother's birthday. So uh, at any rate, uh, We'll start off then, and oh, I have to, I want to take this to time. I, I haven't actually done any public speaking for 25 years, over a quarter of a century, and I have never done a PowerPoint. So Mark Gautel helped me by doing the PowerPoints here. So any, any of the, thank you very much. Any of the good ones are his ideas, any of the others are probably not. Uh, so, uh, thank you very much, Mark. So, uh, I will be trying my best to make this thing go as we flip along. Okay, I'm going to start with a quick overview of public pension funds generally and then a brief history of the Canada Pension Plan. I want to summarize the Alberta government's promises and their guarantees for the APP as well as the documents they have released. I'll also review at least one document which they have not released, as it's also quite germane to this issue. Then I will cover the published performance statistics of AIMCO as compared to our present CPP Investment Board to highlight the Alberta government's competence in this area. And I'm going to leave you with some thoughts to ponder. Be aware that the CPP audited financial statements are issued in March and AIMCO is in December. Qu uh, updates are done quarterly and there have a, include a lot of estimates. And actuarial reports are done triannually. So comparisons are challenging and quarterly variations herein can range 20 to 30 basis points. So I've focused on the long range analysis of at least 10 years, which I believe to f be more useful for our purposes. Oh, let me see here. A public pension plan is a defined benefit social program governed by legislation which creates an enforceable promise of pension income to eligible retirees. Hmm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they come in a few different flavors depending on the funding source. The promise, though, is the bedrock of all pension plans. The pension promise for Canada Pension Plan is contained in federal legislation, which cannot be reduced or amended without an act of parliament, concurrence of the Senate, royal assent, and a similar process with two-thirds of the legislatures of the provinces throughout Canada representing two-thirds of the population. Now, just to compare, the pension promise for an APP is contained in Alberta legislation, which cannot be reduced or amended unless approved by a show of hands at the UCP caucus. <laughs> so which promise would you rather have? How are pensions funded? Well, <laughs> a pay-as-you-go plan is where current workers pay premiums which determine the amount of their pension 
but which are actually used to fund the pensions of current retirees. Essentially, the current generation of workers pays for the pensions of the previous one, and the succeeding generation of workers pays for the pension of current workers. It has a benefit that it can be instituted immediately to start paying pensions when needed, but has several risks, such as political whimsy, demographics, and lack of a solid funding base. By contrast, I think I'm ahead of myself here, but by contrast, a funded pension plan collects premiums from current workers under a predetermined formula, and premiums are invested and held in a pension fund trust for the sole benefit of individual plan members who are beneficiaries. The trustees of a pension fund trust carry a fiduciary responsibility to make investment decisions in the sole interests of the security of pension payments to beneficiaries. The assets in the fund do not belong to the government, nor are they to be used for the benefit of citizens generally. Funds are to be used solely for the beneficiaries in accordance to their individual interest. If you paid more premiums than I did, your claim to assets is greater. If you did not pay premiums for some reason, you have no interest. Governments are not a beneficiary and have no interest in the funds except as a trustee to manage them. CPP started out as a pay-as-you-go plan and was substantially amended for stability in 1997 and now can be considered a hybrid plan with $1 in assets backing up every $3 in liability. Now that's from the 2021 actuarial report, the latest actuarial report. So growing poverty, we talk about the history of CPP, growing poverty among seniors was the catalyst which initiated the CPP in 1965. Almost 40% of seniors at that time were living on incomes below the poverty line, and the percentage was much greater for those living alone. Old age security, only $40 a month. So as constitutional authority for pensions is shared, CPP was initiated and has been jointly governed by the federal and provincial governments since inception. Alberta is and always has been a partner in the governance of CPP. Alberta's Executive Council, that's uh, um, therefore, either knows or should know all of the important details respecting CPP and would have no excuse for not sharing correct information with Albertans. They do know that all contributions to CPP are made by or on behalf of specific individuals, exactly the same for those who live in Alberta as those who live in any other jurisdiction in Canada. And the province has no claim on the funds other than as a trustee to manage them for the benefit of retired workers. CPP came into effect January 1, 1966. Quebec opted out on formation in 1965, and the QPP also came into effect January 1, 1966. QPP was never an operational part of the Canada Pension Plan. When CPP was established, it was of necessity as a pay-as-you-go plan with current workers paying for current retirees. So clearly, on inception, there would have been a major unfunded federal liability. Put a couple of these up. So on inception, there would have been a major federal unfunded liability as well as zero assets in the Canada Pension Plan. However, the birth rate was high, the economy and labor force were growing, and cash flow was positive leading the belief that the unfunded liability could be addressed over the long term. And now we have a wise word from a Shaolin priest.
Demographics are your friend, Grasshopper. I don't know if you remember this guy. <laughs> so what about the unfunded liability? Revenue originally consisted of premiums collected on behalf of current workers and expenditures consisted of payments to retirees with surplus funds, if any, loaned back to the provinces. It was in this environment that the asset sharing formula on provincial withdrawal used by LifeWorks was developed. It was intended to allocate the withdrawing province their share of a negligible asset balance and to require them to assume direct provincial responsibility for their share of the huge unfunded liability. Medical science at the time had not advanced to the point where it was possible to assess the mental competency of a premier who solely on the basis of an extreme personal dislike for a politician of an opposing party with, would withdraw their province from the fund and assume a direct provincial liability for what is currently three times the value of the assets to be acquired. By the late 1960s, major changes in the birth rate were developing and actuarial calculations later confirmed that the fund would be unable to collect sufficient premiums to pay benefits in the, whoopsie, I gotta go back one here. And the fund will be unable to collect sufficient premiums to pay benefits in the long run unless significant plan amendments were made. So at the inception of the pay-as-you-go plan, Canada had almost seven workers for every retiree, and today we're down to almost three workers per retiree. So we do have a warning from Master Poe. And he says, demographics are not always your friend, <laughs> Grasshopper. By 1997, the unfunded liability is up to $428 billion. And the assets were only 7.8% of the total liabilities. And I'm not certain that the majority of those assets were not provincial IOUs. So the federal and provincial governments increased CPP contribution rates and they increased the CPP and they created the CPP Investment Board. I want to take a minute and give some credit to the provincial and federal governments at that time because they really had to take some hard decisions when it needed to be done. At the latest actuarial report in 2021, the unfunded liability was 1.1 trillion, but the assets totaled 33.5% of total liabilities. It's up from 7.8%. So the bottom line is that the joint federal provincial stewardship is going in the right direction. And more importantly, the hybrid plan has reached a steady state funding basis so that the actuaries can certify that CPP is stable for the next 75 years. So what's the UCP plan? Well, the plan is that the UCP government has proposed that Alberta withdraw from the CPP and that a new APP be developed. They have posted on the government website a document by LifeWorks which indicates the benefits that they would believe would accrue to Albertans should it withdraw. On the government websites are several more documents which includes what's, it, what's in it for you, overview and key changes to the Alberta Pension Protection Act, and the Alberta Pension Protection Act itself. These documents outline the UCP government's plans and the promises and guarantees that they are making to garner your support. Individually, they are misleading or outright false, and taken together, exude an odor of mendacity so strong it causes one to gag. <laughs> Not publicly released, for some reason, is the ministerial note containing advice 
from the folks representing Alberta's interest in the governance of CP to the Honorable Travis Taves, then Minister of Finance and President of Alberta Treasury Board, which outlines the UCP assessment of the Fraser Institute report, as well as their real assessment of CPP withdrawal and the creation of an APP, including their assessment of the provincial ability to manage the fund. UCP insists that the LifeWorks documents allows Alberta 53% of the Canada Pension Plan assets or $334 billion on withdrawal. The UCP government is using that number to fund all of their promises. That is misleading at best and likely disingenuous for the following reasons. Firstly, the report actually says that a literal reading of the CPP Act would allow Alberta 117% of the base assets of CPP. Remember that this was written, this formula was written, was based on a CPP originally based on the pay-as-you-go basis, where the only assets to be divided up on withdrawal were the current year's premiums, less pension payments made. The report's author, after allowing that their reading resulted in an unrealistically large transfer, proposed a change in legislative wording, which resulted in the 53% number. Now, many times, I wish that I could change the Income Tax Act as I filed my return, but life just doesn't work that way. <laughs> Additionally, the UCP government has contracted Jim Dinning, who is Alberta's treasurer, when CPP Act was being changed in 1996 and 1997 to advise them. And I'm sure he would not have forgotten the genesis of the computation. As well, and this is kind of an important one, David Dodge, Canada's Deputy Finance Minister at that time, said recently, and this is a very important statement, we wrote rules in the permissive sense and that the provinces were not denied the right to pull out. But we did not write rules around what happened should a province make that decision. So, Ladies and gentlemen, a divorce is allowed, but there is no prenup. <laughs> the report also glibly glosses over the pension liability, which at last actuarial evaluation was three times the value of the assets and which must be directly assumed as a provincial debt upon separating from CPP. And most damning to their credibility is the UCP government's own ministerial memo, written just before they commissioned the LifeWorks report, which indicates that the value of assets, which Alberta will be allowed to access, will be in the range of 15% of the CPP, or less than one-third of the number that they're trying to sell us. UCP insists that moving from CPP, oh, hang on, I gotta get the new slide up here. UCP insists that moving from CPP to an APP will save Albertans $5 billion annually. And that would allow lower premiums to businesses and individuals and bigger pensions for seniors. That course of action is a little like going on a spending spree when you receive an inheritance from the death of a relative. It cannot continue forever. Sooner or later, you run out of relatives. <laughs> In the case of APP, we would be very quickly back to 1995, worrying about if the fund will run dry in a few years. And it will. So those are just some of the things they're planning on doing. Um, now, I'm going to leave it up to you to decide whether these exuberant promises were intentional misrepresentations or just over-reliance on a consultant who refuses to let their actual name be associated with the report. Can the UCP government manage this fund? The UCP government suggests it would be easy to duplicate the investment performance of CPP, but I assure you that CPP investment success is not accidental. 
CPP released their financial results for the period ending March 31, 2024, a few weeks ago. They indicate total assets of $632 billion, but a more interesting number in the report is that CPP investments had contributed 432 billion of that, so 68% came from investments. Estimates which I have read suggest that as each Canadian's pension matures and they begin to collect at least 80% of each retirement pension payment will be from investment earnings. Investment management is the single most important facet of pension viability. Recognizing the staggering importance of investment management to the trustees of any pension plan in fulfilling their statutory, statutory fiduciary obligations to future pensioners, one would think this issue would have been central in the minds of Alberta's UCP cabinet when they commissioned the LifeWorks APP document. But instead, the actual report, which outlines four different options, is intellectually weak, inconclusive, hints at non-achievable benefits, for example, thousands of new investment management jobs, and literally gleams with the massive sprinkles of pixie dust floating down from unicorns soaring overhead. Now I know unicorns. It allows that two options, using private sector managers and creating a new service provider, are both not really feasible. While it also suggests that subcontracting the service back to CPP might work, it ignores the fact that a substantially smaller CPP would no longer have the organizational capacity to provide the service and couldn't in any event due to fiduciary concerns. So the only investment manager comparison we need to make to is today's CPPIB with today's AIMCO. And luckily, much research has been completed on the top nine big pension managers in Canada. So I can compare the two at roughly the same time. Firstly, the management expense ratio, we call it a MER, cost for CPP is 0.97%. And for AIMCO, is only 0.63%. Clearly, CPP invests more money in managing investments, but is it worth it? The old adage that you should not let the MER tail wag the investment dog is true here. After payment of all MER costs, CPP booked a 9.2% compound rate of return over 10 years, which is the best of all pension funds in the top nine, while AIM co-booked 7.2% uh, compound rate of return, which is the worst performance in the top nine. The difference over the life of the plan will be hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars, which would be forfeited if we left CPP for an APP. The only rational choice for Albertans is not to leave CPP, where their pension funds will be managed with stability for the next 75 years, as certified by the Chief Actuary of Canada, who signed the report with her real name less than two years ago. What about the UCP referendum on whether to proceed? On their website, the UCP government has published a promise which states, the Alberta Pension Protection Act guarantees Albertans must vote in favour of an APP during a referendum before the government withdraws from Canada Pension Plan to establish an APP. Now many Albertans, including myself occasionally, simply rely on government re news releases like the guarantee just mentioned. After all, if you cannot trust your Premier, who can you trust? <laughs> and the guarantees and promises that she made are ironclad. But out of an abundance of prudence, I decided to actually analyze the legislation to see if it supported the promises and guarantees respecting the referendum. It does not. The promises and guarantees of Premier Smith 
are not supported by her legislation. While it's true that Premier Smith must first order a referendum and hold a vote before proceeding with her plan, there is no requirement that she abides by the results of the referendum. Section 2.3 of the Act contains Premier Smith's weasel clause. It states that an order under subsection 1 shall specify whether the results of the referendum are to be binding. So the conclusion on this one, and, and firstly I want to apologize to all weasels for <laughs> suggesting that they might possess the same ethics as Premier Smith. <laughs> but regardless of how Albertans cast their ballot, if Premier Smith specifies that the vote is not to be binding, she is authorized by the act to proceed with her confiscation plan to withdraw your money from the Canada Pension Plan. You are not guaranteed to be decision maker over your own pension, and the statement that Albertans must vote in favour of the APP before Premier Smith proceeds to access the funds from the CPP is not true. So, I'm going to leave you with some thoughts to ponder, and I'm going to leave this PowerPoint up here now. Um, I had several points, but there are many more that I was going to put there. But I thought about it, and I kind of thought that I could summarize all of the points that aren't there, as well as all of the points that are here, as well as all of the half dozen essays that I've written on this topic with one word. Why? We already have one of the best managed, defined benefit, sovereign pension plans in the world. There are no proven benefits to a much smaller, high risk pension plan. Ladies and gentlemen, why? I'm David Carpenter. Thank you for your attention. So as a unique weekly opportunity for people to discuss issues, SACPA is supported by many in our community. Thank you, first, to the LSCO who've provided this room free of charge. Wow, and thank all of you for patronizing their lunch counter. Thank you to the University of Lethbridge for their ongoing support for 56 years. Thank you to the Lethbridge Herald. We had the Herald reporter here, Al Bieber, a few minutes ago and the other media for their coverage and support. Thanks to Rogers TV and Ryan Craddock for recording our sessions available on the TV and our SACPA.ca archives. Next week's talk topic on June 13th will be the University of Lethbridge professor Jennifer Copeland. She was in the Antarctica in November 2023 and she will speak on is the Antarctica the canary in the coal mine on climate change. Okay, we ask those of you who have questions for David Carpenter to please line up here where Knud and Henning are lined up and uh, we'll bring David back to the microphone. Thank you. And David, if you stand right there, thank you. And Henning, you can come first. Hi, I'm Henning Mundel, and thank you so much for such a clear uh, presentation. A question I have relates to the referendum and the Premier being able to ignore. Heads I win, tails you lose. However, with the requirement of other provinces and population numbers having to accept that, how can she do that? Could she actually do it? Uh, 
Thanks, uh, Henning. Yes, there's certainly a school of thought uh, that indicates because Alberta withdrawing or any province withdrawing would create such a massive change that it will require the authority of two-thirds of the provinces representing two-thirds of the population as well as the federal government. But there is also an equally weighted thought that there is a provision for withdrawal to happen. Just no idea on how. So I can't give you a definitive answer on that. You did raise it. It's a wonderful question and an, an excellent point. I just don't have an answer for you. Uh, I'm Maureen Hawkins. And I'd like to ask you two questions. One stupid question. What exactly is an unfunded liability and where does it come from? I actually was going to bribe somebody to ask that question. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. OK, so a funded pension plan gives a promise, remember we talked about a promise, to people when they retire to get a certain amount of money predetermined, they can calculate it uh, on a number of different bases. And so the present value of that promise can be significant amounts of money. And in the case of our, our current uh, actuarial report at the end of 2021, the liability, the, the total liability of all those pensions that have been backed up by the government's promise is about $1.7 trillion. Government has about $600 billion in investments right now. So the unfunded liability is the amount of the liability that's not backed up by investments. So that's 1.1 trillion. Is that fairly clear? That, that makes it clear, yeah. Okay. So that's the money they don't have. That's the money they don't have. Now, I've, I've been on the boards of several pension plans, and you would get really worried if you had 1.1 trillion in liabilities that you didn't have the money to pay, uh, other than if my visa bill sometimes, but well, that's another issue. Um, <laughs> With a sovereign government, this is not as significant an issue as it would be with a corporate pension plan or with your own RRSP or with a provincial pension plan. A sovereign government continues on far beyond the life of a single person. And they calculate it goes hundreds and hundreds of years into the future. And so it's not necessarily a bad thing that they have a hybrid plan which relies not only on a funded balance to get us over these demographic problems that do come up occasionally, but also to cover off the, the pay-as-you-go part of it. So that's why the actuaries, it takes them a year to do all the calculations to determine that we are going to be sound for the next 75 years. And it took 25 years from when these changes were made in 1997 before they could say that. In 1997, they thought the Canada Pension Plan would be bankrupt. There would be no money to pay pensions by just past 2010. So we have a really good pension plan and they made some tough choices. and. Uh, and if you start, if somebody goes ahead and starts paying out bonuses in addition to retirees, or they start going ahead and say, we can cut all the premiums and things will be just fine, they'll be just fine for a couple years. And then all of a sudden, we're going to be right back to where we were. So anyway, thank you for the question. As I say, I should probably pay you money for that. But. <laughs> and I had a second question. Well, I love your questions. <laughs> The whole Alberta calling thing, getting as many people to move to Alberta as possible, preferably skilled laborers, 
I had thought was primarily to reduce wages because I know senior, very experienced, skilled wage workers who can't find a job unless they'll take $17 an hour. But I'm wondering, is it also to improve the demographic and make pay-as-you-go looks better? I'm sorry that I don't think I can answer that question because I really am not up to speed on a lot of the issues that will go into it. So I'm not going to justify, I, I just can't, can't help on that one today. Need to stand on my tippy toes here. Um, Terry Shellington is my name. And um, I, I, I have a question that's partly political and partly financial. But as long as I've been in Alberta, which is many decades now, I, I've been told that conservatives really know how to manage uh, money in the economy. And, and the Democrats are, are just flailing away as rookies. Uh, so and there must be some people in the conservative party, UCP party, that uh, can add and subtract. So that leads to my question. <laughs> that leads to my question. What's the purpose of this uh, pension venture, and is it really to establish a pension plan, or is it simply a distraction uh, in the first year of a mandate? Um, and is there any sign that they're really pr planning to proceed with it and do the heavy lifting politically that it's involved in actually doing it, or is it just a, uh, you know, um, distraction? Thank you, Terry. Um, well, firstly, I can remember when we did have a conservative government. Um, <laughs> I was quite supportive of conservative governments because what I found is people who told the truth, had integrity, were honorable, were straightforward, told you what they knew, even if they had to say no, you could respect it because you know where they were coming from. Never would you hear somebody like Peter Lougheed or, or Clint Dunford look you in the eye and tell a lie. It just wouldn't happen. And going through this material and finding not only verbal inconsistencies with the facts, but written inconsistencies with the facts from the Alberta government website leads me to believe that I don't know what this current government is, but they're not conservative. I've worked with the ND, I've worked actually, I've been appointed to various provincial positions by every political party since social credit including UCP. Um, I found the NDP, to answer the other part of your question, to be very easy to work with because they followed the rules. Um, I do not have exactly the same stellar opinion of our current Premier. I think your days of being appointed by the UCP are numbered, but, uh, <laughs> but my my question. I'm Chris from Chris from the Castle Valley. Uh, my my question is, what's next? And what I, what I understand, what I understand to be happening next is uh, the government's going to go on holiday for the summer, and they're going to come back in the fall. And in the fall, the CPPIB will actually put out a number saying what Alberta is entitled to. And my understanding is if our Premier doesn't like the number, she's going to take somebody to court. What are, what are the next steps? Uh, hopefully by then I'll be finished my law degree and I'll be able to cash in on the bonanza. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, 
Yeah, I don't know, uh, to be totally honest. Uh, uh, as I said, there is no prenup. So the amount of, uh, if there is, if there is a split, what you would sort of hope for is that the assets to be assumed would be roughly in the same percentage as the liability to be assumed. But there are so many other issues. I can't count the number of people that move to Kelowna and retire from Lethbridge uh, or, or anywhere else. And whose retirees are they? Wh whose money does that come? There are so many things to be negotiated um, that I really have no idea how it's going to work. And I don't think anybody else does either. So trying to boil it down to one number shows an understanding of finance so simplistic that I'm surprised they give her a credit card and a savings account. <laughs> Colleen Quintel, I've enjoyed your presentation. Uh, my question also has to do with process, but should they come to a number? And it, obviously it's gonna take some time to get there if the UCP really pushes it, they're gonna to come to a number. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what then the process would be um, in terms of length of time? That is there legislation um, that about the exit and what we could expect in the future should it happen? Well, uh, not much. There, uh, there's a, a, apparently a three-year, once the notice is given, there's a three-year time frame. But uh, this will surprise you. They don't actually uh, tell me what their plans are anymore. <laughs> Chris, maybe Chris can help with that. I don't, um, and, and in fact, I actually did resign from, uh, uh, I wasn't getting along as well as you might think. <laughs> or, uh, but, but then the guys after me all got fired, so maybe that. <laughs> uh, 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 so no, I, I, I really, the, the only thing that crossed my mind is that when it does come to a referendum, you'd think, gee, we should all just ignore the referendum. The problem is you can't do that. Because if you ignore the referendum and they have one guy that votes in favor, then she says, I've got the moral authority to proceed. So at least make it hard. Participate in the referendum, vote against it, tell everybody else to say no, don't do it. Um, at least make it hard for them. But that's about all I can suggest. Thank you. Finally, I don't have to lower the mic. Uh, Ken Sears, um, what a, my question is about AIMCO, because AIMCO, as it now stands, is the Alberta government's way of intervening, uh, in, in, in involving themselves in the pension plans in this province. Where did AIMCO come from? I know they took over other existing pension plans, not quite happily, but where did they come from? And is there any indication that they will improve their ability to manage the funds which they haven't done all that well with? Okay, so AIMCO, Alberta Investment Management Company, Corporation, is owned by the province. And it was set up by the province to manage provincial government assets. Uh, they also do private investing, so they go out and try to get clients and customers. And, and I, I'm going to be, I have worked with them, and there are some re really good people administratively in AIMCO. There's, uh, so they're not a bunch of buffoons at all. They are, you know, they're really good civil servants that do a good job. Where the problems come in is uh, the, this recent, uh, oh, it was just when UCP came in, they ordered that all 
so I, I, I could have been with, um, say, uh, WCB. We had a fund there of about, uh, it's about 10 billion right now. And they were ordering all of those funds, and that was a 10 billion worth of money held aside to pay for injured workers in the future. And it'd be turned over to AIMCO. And the needs for WCB were far different. And we had specific, because we have a, a long, long liability tail there. Uh, and it's the same thing. They ordered that all Crown corporations work with AIMCO. Now, as I say, I've, uh, I've dealt with them. They, they do their very best. Uh, they just don't have the feet on the street. The Canada Pension Investment Board has about well over a third of its investments in private equity. So these are, so this is, I, I begin, I'll just use 35%, it's pretty close. These are invitational things. You've got to know the people worldwide. This is like putting up the money to buy a, or to build an airport in Cancun or a, a port in Abu Dhabi or something like that. So not very high risk, really good return on investment, but you got to know people. AIMCO just doesn't have the feet on the street. They've got 8% in that kind of investment. And so it's, it's really hard to duplicate the performance of CPPIB when you don't have the people around the world needed to do it. So, uh, but uh, AIMCO exists. They do the best they can with what they've got. Um, that's all I can tell you. Huh. Gail McMartin. My questions and concerns are really around process. And you've uh, alluded to it in, in some ways. Uh, in the reading that I've done, it seems that we need to give three years notice to leave the plan. Then the province has a year to come up with a plan to present for the exit. Then the act needs to be changed. In order to do that, seven province, two thirds of the provinces need to agree. Then we probably will have court cases and challenges. We're looking at a 10-year process, and many of us in this room, it won't matter. <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe our narrative needs to start appealing to the 50-year-olds. It is they who really have a vested interest in this, uh, because in 15 years, they'll be the 65-year-olds who will be depending on a pension plan. And so therefore, I guess I'm wondering, as you were saying about getting your law degree, um, is this j just another grand idea and scheme to funnel a lot of money to your friends in law, in, in, in lawyer fees? <laughs> Rico, what do you think about that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I, you know, when I ended my presentation, I ended it with one word, and that word was why. And, and the reason I, I stopped at one word is that I don't have solid evidence of what I consider the motivation to be, not only for the changes that we're seeing proposed for CPP and, and uh, uh, the Alberta Pension Plan, but for changes as to how they have relationships with municipalities, changes as to municipal bylaws. Uh, and, and you have seen all the, the, the problems with uh, clear-cutting or whatever. Uh, there's a whole bunch of things 
and I don't know what the rationale is for all of that. I think if you start to read on some of these websites for um, the, the talk about a different relationship with Canada or possible sovereign Alberta, you might find one that actually lists these particular things that are happening all in order. I don't know, you might find one. And that still doesn't say that that's what the, the road they're trying to take. And I wouldn't be the one to suggest it. But I cannot answer the question as to motivation. I simply do not know. I do know that they were asked when they won the election to manage the province and they seem to put that on the back burner and they're doing all this other stuff. I would prefer to have healthcare work, you know, just for one. Hi, Barb Phillips. Thank you for your presentation, very informative. I could be the poster child for CPP because my first job, 1966, when I graduated, I paid into CPP and then I did my thing and at age 60, I started withdrawing from CPP. Uh, two years later though, my, my first husband passed away and I was the recipient then of survivor's benefits. I think it was a lump sum of $2,500 and then I get a portion even today, 15 years after I started withdrawing from CPP, uh, of his benefits. I have not seen any mention from the APP that I would continue to get reimbursed for my first husband, so I don't know about that. So my question to you is, why also? Why are we doing all this and upsetting the apple cart when it doesn't need to be upset? Yeah, I haven't r r come across any specific promises as to um, pensions or things other than they indicate in the Alberta Pension Protection Act that people will receive the same amount or greater pensions than they would normally get under the CPP. What they don't say is whether or not the APP will be certified to be fiscally sound after they make all these payments. And that's, so I'm sure the, uh, as the, one of the former questioners indicated, we're probably okay if we make it uh, five years. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> yeah, but somebody else is gonna, there's, what we should be looking for is to keep the pension plan the envy of the rest of the world, which it is right now. This will be our last question. So my name is Mark Edel. Uh, you mentioned the complexities of interprovincial movement, but in a way, this is already happening. My first 10 years of employment were with Quebec, and I paid into the Quebec pension plan. Now I'm receiving the Canada pension plan, and those first 10 years are counting towards the amount that I'm getting in CPP. I'm wondering, is there some kind of formula that actually QPP is transferring money into CPP? Uh, do, do you know how that works? <laughs> no. <laughs> actually, there, there, is a, there, there is an agreement with QPP and CPP that exists right now. And, and it was relatively simple to negotiate because they were independent. They started off, uh, QPP was never a, a partner of, so it was a reciprocal arrangement that they could put together. Negotiating an agreement from withdrawal where you've got the asset base, the liability base, interprovincial movement, people can move wherever they want in Canada currently, um, 
is going to, I have no idea. It, it will be a, a difficult negotiation. So usually we ask the presenter to leave us with something either to do or think about from your presentation before we leave. So what would you like to leave us and our viewers uh, as food for thought? Uh, the first thing I would like to do is to the organizers and basically tell people about this uh, thing that I'm supposed to do beforehand. So, because <laughs> I'm lost right now. Uh, desperately trying to come up with something. But, hey, you all know what's at stake here. Uh, what you've heard about is a bunch of, a pot of money. And it ranges from 100 billion with 350 billion or more. Remember that that money is spoken for. It is not available to be used for any other purpose. And if they start using it for economic development, you know where that can sometimes lead. These guys, you remember Novotel cell phone company. You remember the magnesium plant up at High River. These guys don't have the world's best rep when it comes to making investment decisions. So let's leave it with the professionals to manage and to try to carry on like that. So that's all I can give you, Bev. <laughs>